All right, the final PVA model that we will be working with involves the loggerhead sea turtle. Now, I'm gonna go through a little background on the loggerhead sea turtle in a minute, but I just want to mention that this population model and the paper that was that used this model, Crowder et al., uh, sorry, 1994, um, that's this paper right here, um, which is a part of this module and it's provided in Web Campus. This is Larry Crowder et al., 1994, and its title is Predicting the Impact of Turtle Excluder Devices on Loggerhead Sea Turtle Populations. So after running this model, take time to read this paper. It was highly influential paper on the conservation of loggerhead sea turtles and it directly used this model, this population model that we're going through right now. All right. So we're gonna also demonstrate what's called scenario testing as part of this population viability analysis model. Population viability analysis, like I said, is a way to do some experiments with rare and endangered species that experiments that couldn't be done otherwise. Models provide a test bed for enabling us to run experiments of different management scenarios, conservation scenarios, different futures like climate change or different climate change scenarios. We're gonna run several conservation scenarios for the loggerhead sea turtle and run the model under various scenarios and try to figure out which scenario is most effective in managing populations and conserving populations of loggerhead sea turtles. But before we get into the modeling, the numbers, and the scenario testing, let's first get a little background on loggerhead sea turtles. And I encourage you to visit some of these websites, which will give you more information. Like this NOAA website is, is really informative on the loggerhead sea turtles. So I encourage you to read through this and learn a little bit more about this species and the conservation challenges that it faces. All right, um, the loggerhead sea turtle, scientific name Coretta Coretta, is a large marine turtle with a nearly global distribution, although it's not really found in the Arctic um, regions, um, or Antarctic for that matter. Nesting areas in, in the USA include areas along the, the South Atlantic coast, um, especially in Florida, where the, there's, there's huge nesting beaches, um, but uh, they will nest all the way north to New Jersey, which is pretty rare for a sea turtle to nest that far uh, from the tropics. Um, and you will see individuals along the Pacific coast as well, but it's a very common site during nesting season along the Atlantic coast. All right, um, and I should mention that all populations of loggerhead sea turtles are listed as threatened under the uh, U.S. Uh, Endangered Species Act. Several populations are listed as endangered. Um, these turtles have a really complex life history, very interesting life history that's going to come into play when we run our models and when we run our scenario tests. These turtles lay eggs on nesting beaches, like I said, and after hatching, the baby turtles will make a mad dash towards the ocean. They use light signals uh, from the stars to guide in the reflections of the stars and the moon off the water to guide their way to the water. And once they make it to the water, they spend several years just floating in the water, amazingly enough. And when they float, they, they just use ocean currents to float. And it, of course, many of them are eaten during this stage, um, either on land by animals like raccoons or in the water by animals like predatory fish. Um, but those that make it will float ultimately to areas of sea mats uh, where there, there's uh, local downwelling of the water and they this uh, plants an algae material called sargassum accumulates and they'll feed on little invertebrates that are inhabiting the sargassum and spend several years just passively <laughs> floating around in ocean debris essentially. 
After a while, when they get big enough, they will migrate from the sargassum mats into uh, near shore waters uh, to mature. And that they will often use uh, seagrass uh, mat areas, um, but these coastal uh, seagrass beds. Um, and they, when they get even bigger, they, they, they'll continue to stick around in the shallow coastal uh, continental shelf areas, um, even as subadults and, and adults. And once they get big enough and ready to breed and the females will return to a nesting beach and they generally return to the, the, the beach where they originally uh, were born uh, to breed. Amazingly enough, they kind of remember where they were born and they go back and there's the kind of completes the life cycle. So it's a very interesting life cycle, and like I said, some of the threats that they face are directly relevant to that life cycle, so we'll come back to that. Like I said, the species has been federally listed um, since 1978 uh, under the Endangered Species Act, and many populations are in fact endangered. This is the range of the loggerhead sea turtle, and it encompasses much of the globe. Um, so a circumglobal population, Essentially, um, and in the U.S., it's that southeastern area that they're most commonly observed. Let's go through the threats that this species faces. And there's multiple threats that this species faces, including alteration of nesting beaches. And that, you know, that this coastal areas are desirable places for people to build. And that is not necessarily a great thing for the turtles because that alteration of those nesting beaches can cause major problems and can reduce the amount of nesting beaches that are available um, to these animals. In addition, the light pollution can have an impact as well. Uh, it, the development of coastal areas can cause lights um, to uh, be shining away from the water rather than from the water. That that reflection of light from the water is what do, um, directs these turtles towards uh, the hatchling turtles towards the water, and they can be misdirected by lights that are anthropogenic in nature, and they can uh, go the wrong direction away from the water, which is not a good thing for them. So threats to nesting beaches is a is one major uh, problem that they face. Um, all right. Um, incidental mortality due to marine fisheries. That's uh, the second threat that we're going to consider. Once hatchlings reach the ocean, they have many different threats as they mature. Um, at the sargassum feeding stage, um, during the juvenile stage, subadult stage, and adult stages. Um, you know, they, they will face different threats. In particular, these shrimp trawlers um, are a major issue for loggerhead sea turtles, especially those that are feeding, those juveniles that are feeding in, in seagrass mats especially. That's where uh, these trawlers, which basically uh, destroy the, the benthic habitat and will catch almost anything that it, uh, you know, as it's trawling, it'll catch pretty much anything living, um, including loggerhead sea turtles. Now, loggerhead sea turtles need to breathe air, like all turtles. They need to breathe air. They can spend quite a bit of time underwater, but eventually they have to come up for air. If they can't come up for air, if they're caught in a trawling net, they will not be able to survive very long. So this is a major problem. Um, this is called bycatch accidental capture of animals like turtles that, you know, they're not trying to catch turtles, they're trying to catch shrimp and other economically valuable um, animals, but they will catch turtles sometimes and the turtles will drown in these nets. So that's a major problem for juveniles and subadults and adults to, to some extent, um, this, this bycatch. In addition, sometimes Turtles are hit by ocean-going vessels, uh, sometimes uh, other types of bycatch with long line, hook and line, and trap fisheries uh, that might target other species like tuna. 
that can also catch loggerhead turtles. Other threats include, um, you know, sometimes oh, these turtles will go dormant during cold periods, burying themselves in muddy areas within bays and estuaries. If during that period dredging equipment comes through, that can easily kill a bunch of uh, loggerhead sea turtles. Turtles will sometimes accidentally feed on debris like styrofoam peanuts, plastic bags, tar balls, and balloons. Um, turtles may become entangled in fishing equipment. They may become stranded and may drown for other reasons. Um, as well, due to being entangled. Um, shallow swimming turtles may collide with boat propellers. Uh, toxins can be an issue and sometimes people will still go in and, and harvest eggs um, and sometimes people may catch these animals for and eat them but that's not a huge issue um, so those are the main threats uh, we have threats to nesting beaches incidental mortality or bycatch due to fisheries and then some additional issues um, such as toxins and debris. All right, let's build a population model now for the loggerhead sea turtle. This is a long lived species. It's really important that we uh, break this species up into age classes because these age classes, as we, as we saw up in this life history, the life history is quite complex and each life history stage is very different from others. Obviously the mortality for, of these hatchling stage is gonna be much higher than the mortality of the adult stage. So it's important that we conceptualize the life history and put this together um, uh, by stage classes. So, what we're going to do is define the stage classes um, and the, the stage classes in this case, we're gonna have a hatchling stage, a small juvenile stage, a large juvenile stage, a subadult stage, and an adult stage. So there's five stages in this model. Um, then we need to define the vital rates. So we need to parameterize this model and we're gonna parameterize the model directly from this paper. This, uh, this is the Crowder et al. paper that I showed you earlier. Um, this actually has vital rates defined for each of these um, stages. So we have this egg stage. Here's a survival rate for the egg stage, small juvenile stage, large juvenile, so on and so forth. So uh, we have the, the numbers from this paper and um, I have summarized them here. So we have uh, two types of vital rates. We have um, uh, what we call survival, which in this case just means staying in a particular stage. So staying in, say, the subadult stage from one year to the next, that would be um, this here, stay subadult. Um, and the vital rate is 68.2%. So 68.2% will stay subadult each year, whereas some may transition. This 6% may transition from subadult to adult. So oftentimes these will be called growth parameters and these will be called survival parameters, but um, that's what they mean. Um, all right, and we also have uh, fecundities, which is the number of hatchlings successfully produced by females from each class. Now, there's only two classes that can reproduce, and that is stage four subadults, which were expected to produce on average 4.67 hatchlings each year, and then adults, which are expected to produce 61.9 hatchlings per year. And those are the vital rates for the model. That's really all we need and we, well, in addition to initial abundances. We're not going to have any stochasticity or randomness in this model. Um, so there's no uncertainty as well about any of these parameters. So we're going to assume that we know these parameters are the correct parameters. And we also are uh, not interested in modeling the uncertainty um, by incorporating random numbers into this model. So it's a fairly simple model, but that is exactly the model that Crowder et al. present in this paper. And it still was very, very influential and useful. And finally, we need to simulate 
our model and project the future. And the way we're going to do that is called matrix multiplication. Now, this is a standard way to, to run projections for stage structured populations like this. You know, we have hatchling sub, sub adult um, or small juvenile, sorry, hatchling, small juvenile, large juvenile, uh, sub adult and adult in, in this population. Um, when we uh, put together a matrix, we're basically taking these vital rates, these transition rates. So each of these rates represents a, a transition of some sort. This is a transition from stage one to two or hatchling to small juvenile. And that's 67.5% um, of the hatchlings will transition to small juveniles in uh, a year. And reproduction rates are also just a transition rate. It's a transition between a an adult or reproductive class and in, and new individuals, basically newly created individuals. Um, and so each subadult will produce on average 4.67 uh, hatchlings and each adult will produce on average 61.9 hatchlings. So uh, these are all essentially transition rates. We can then take those rates and put them in this structure called a matrix and if you take my class, we will learn a lot more about matrices, but we're not gonna go into great detail. I do provide some more information on matrix population models. At the end of this website, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about matrices, in addition, it can be really helpful to run through the Excel um, demonstration that I also provide as part of uh, this lecture at the bottom. It's optional, but I recommend going through it because it will really, um, reinforce what we're actually doing here. Um, but, you know, we're going to use Insight Maker to run these models. Um, but I do recommend going through the Excel demonstration as well. A projection matrix is also known as a transition matrix. And it just represents transitions from whatever the name of the column is to whatever the name of the row is. So this cell here, this is this is uh, an image from an Excel spreadsheet. This represents the transition from hatchling, that's what the column name is, to, sub, to um, small juvenile. So hatchling to small juvenile, 67.5% of hatchlings this year become small juveniles next year. So that's just the way to interpret it. Let's do a couple more. Uh, large juveniles um, have a 65.7% chance of staying large juveniles. So 65.7% of large juveniles this year become large juveniles next year. And finally, let's look at this 61.896. That is, you take all the adults this year and you multiply it by 61.896 to get the total number of hatchlings produced. That's a transition basically from adult into hatchling. Now, I, again, I'm not going to go into great detail about projection matrices and matrix population modeling. That is the uh, subject for another day. Um, but just know that what we're doing here is basically matrix population modeling. Even when we go into Insight Maker, what we're doing is matrix population modeling. Um, so once we've done this <laughs> this demo, um, this PVA model together, you will have some experience with matrix population modeling. You can do that in R, Excel, or Insight Maker, or any other number of modeling tools. R is a very commonly used statistical programming language. Um, so it's, I totally recommend learning R and getting familiar with R because it's so powerful and so useful. Excel you've surely had some experience with, but you can run these models in Excel in the demo um, later in the lecture, which I, is optional and I won't go through in this video, will um, you know, use Excel to make population projections. Um, we're gonna use Insight Maker though. Let's get started with simulation modeling. Click on the link uh, to load up the Insight Maker model for the loggerhead sea turtle population viability analysis. It should look something like this. 
um, and make sure you clone clone it so you can make changes on your own um, and you can save your your changes. You can hit simulate. It should look something like this. If it doesn't, make sure the parameters are correct. So it should look like this. This is uh, a similar figure done in R, but there there should be it should be very similar. See. Those are really the same, just done in different modeling frameworks. If it doesn't look like that, just go back up to the parameters and make sure that those parameters match what's in the model. So for instance, the transition from stage two to three, that is from small to large juvenile, should be 4.7%. Let's just go in and check that. Transition from small to large juvenile should be 4.7% and it is. So just make sure that those uh, numbers are correct. And it's a good idea just to go through the model and make sure you understand what's going on. You have a bunch of stocks, you have this, oops, you have um, growth, which is a bit just the transition from uh, one stock to the next stock or hatchling to juvenile in this case. Um, individuals can either die or transition to the next stage. And there's two reproductive stages. Those subadult and adult define what, how many births are coming in. You can see that here where you take the adults and multiply it by the total hatchling production of adults or the, the fecundity. And then you add the number of hatchlings that would be expected to be produced by subadults. So just make sure you understand how the model works and that the model looks right. All right. And once the model, once you understand what's going on and you have the model working, then we can start to run those scenario tests that we talked about at the very beginning. We're gonna specifically test some different conservation actions that we could take to conserve loggerhead sea turtles. And if possible, you know, we, how we've done this in the past is to do this in small groups. So we break up into small groups in the classroom, but clearly we are not in a classroom right now. So if we can, it, it's awesome if you could work in small groups, but if you're working on your own, that is perfectly fine as well. Let's investigate four management scenarios for the loggerhead sea turtle population. Number one, test a scenario where you improve fecundity. And this is going to represent nest site protection. So imagine that we're going out and we're protecting nest sites. That is likely to improve the ability of these animals to uh, produce more offspring. So if we can improve fecundity to 1.5 times its current value, see what happens. All you have to do is run it once because this is not a stochastic model. We do not have to run the sensitivity testing tool. We just have to run it once. So all you need to do is go in, change fecundity for subadults or adults as required. Let's look back at, so you're gonna improve fecundity to 1.5 times the current value. So what you'd have to do is multiply the subadult fecundity by 1.5 and the adult fecundity by 1.5, put those values in and then simulate the model and see if the population is growing. Clearly this population right now, not good. This, is, this population is exponentially declining down here, down to approximately zero by year 100. We want a growing population. We wanna see a population that has the, the ability to be stable or growing over time. All right, next, let's imagine we, we implement some nest monitoring programs. And by nest monitoring, what we're gonna do is we're going to make sure that hatchlings aren't eaten when they hatch and that the hatchlings manage to make it to the water. So this could potentially, let's imagine, improve the, the um, hatchling survival to 90% or even 100%. Imagine we could have 100% hatchling survival. If we do an incredible job monitoring nesting beaches, maybe we can get the hatchling survival up to 100%. So all you have to do is change 
Now make sure each at each one of these uh, scenarios, you have to revert. So once you've changed um, fecundity values uh, in, in part one, put them back to the value they, sh they originally were and then go on and make the change. So now we can change hatchling survival. There we go. Oh, where is hatchling? Uh, hatchling growth. That's this hatchling growth scenario. You can make that to 0 0.9. That is 90% are going to transition to to the next class or even 100%. So one, you can make that one and see what happens. Hit simulate. Does that manage to make a growing population? Next, imagine we install what are called turtle excluder devices on shrimp trawlers. And that's going to allow these loggerhead turtles to escape and not become bycatch. So they can escape the trawlers now and then they can go on with their daily life. It's going to uh, increase the survival of the large juvenile class especially. So increase the large juvenile survival by 15%. That is add 0.15 to the baseline juvenile survival. And then try increasing it by 25%. Add 25% to the existing juvenile survival rate and see what happens. Run the model. Does that make the population grow or increase? And then finally, let's imagine we're restricting longline fisheries. So there's additional bycatch due to longline fisheries. And that's going to affect especially the sub-adult and adult survival rates because those are the ones that are typically caught in longline fishery operations. First, try increasing the adult and sub-adult survival by 5%. That is add 0.05 to the existing values and then try increasing by 10%, adding 0.1 to the existing sub-adult and adult survival. Remember, each time you do one of these actions, revert what you did previously so that you start with the baseline model each time. So those are your scenarios that I'd like you to test. And for each scenario, just make sure you consider the short-term outlook, that is four to six years out into the future, and also the long-term outlook, up to 100 years into the future. And please write down your responses in Web Campus to the following questions. Number one, which is the most important question, and this is the reason this paper became so influential in conservation of the species. What is your management recommendation for this population on the basis of this model? and the scenario tests that you just ran, and why. So please take your time with this one, run a bunch of scenario tests, and come up with a thoughtful answer for what is your management recommendation for this population. And then secondly, in the base model, why does the population always seem to grow during the first few years, even if it ultimately declines? So we can go back and simulate again and just see what I mean. It's growing during the first 10, 15, or say 10 years, and then it starts by year 10 or 12, it starts declining exponentially. Pretty much all of the age classes are declining by year 10. Why is that? And this is kind of a, just a thought question for you to try to uh, puzzle out. Why does it exhibit this type of weird growth pattern where it starts off growing but ultimately declines? What's going on there? All right, so with that, have fun with that, and I look forward to looking at your responses. And um, that concludes our PVA uh, mini course.